Look at me and tell me what you see. I look at you and tell you what I feel. Look at me and tell me what you see. I look at you and tell you what I feel. Welcome back to the Mummy series with the sequel, The Mummy Returns. Not exactly the most unique title. And The Mummy was a rather singular experience, without any kind of plot point to suggest a sequel. So what were the filmmakers to do when a sequel was greenlit? Why make shit up and retcon harder than a DC executive? This is The Mummy Returns. The film opens once again in ancient Egypt, as the narration tells us of the Scorpion King and his army attacking Thebes. And yes, the Scorpion King is played by Dwayne The Rock Johnson. It was novel then, but nobody cares now. The Scorpion King and his army is defeated, even though the only battle we see them engage in is one they seem to be winning hands down, so apparently it doesn't matter how they were defeated, and they're forced to walk into the desert to die. The army all perish in the desert except for the Scorpion King, who makes a pact with the god Anubis to spare his life and let him defeat his enemies for his soul, which Anubis gives him a scorpion to eat. Because let it not be said that the gods have a sense of irony. An oasis sprouts around the Scorpion King and he now commands an army of jackal warriors and they attack and practically destroy Thebes. However, as that's what the Scorpion King wanted, Anubis takes his soul and the army disappears, ending the opening narration. The film moves to 1933 and we get a rather overly long reveal of Rick O'Connell as he wanders around the ruins until he's startled by something truly awful. Something so horrible it doesn't even bear thinking about. Alex? <laughs> yes, O'Connell and Evie had a child. Think of him as the Jake Lloyd of the film. Actually, that's just offensive to... Alex tells O'Connell about his tattoo, which will get really stupid later. Meanwhile, Evie is brushing a wall, and to show she's no longer the damsel in distress but a badass now, she kicks a poisonous snake away. At O'Connell, so that was thoughtful. O'Connell breaks open the door, and are you ready for the movie to start its retcon? Ever since I had that dream, this place is all I can think about. Ever since you had that dream, I haven't had a decent night's sleep. Yeah, I'll get to that in good time. Outside the ruins, some bad guys show up, and we know they're the bad guys because the camera shows us their guns. Even though O'Connell has a massive gun collection with him at all times. But never mind about that. Alex is in the main chamber of the ruins. Actually, who in their right mind brings a child to a potentially dangerous ancient ruin? What purpose does he serve being there? Are babysitters that hard to find in the 1930s? Also, it should be noted that Alex is 8 in this film, which is set in 1933. So, unless he was conceived before Evie and O'Connell met in 1926, the math doesn't really work. Anyway, the thugs enter the chamber as Alex climbs up a scaffolding to hide from them, and one of them leaves to presumably kill Evie and O'Connell. Which they're currently in the secret chamber, and they come to a dead end. However, suddenly Evie gets a vision as her surroundings change and she sees the door in front of her open with a chest inside. The door is locked and Evie sees the combination. Oh dear. Hints of a character's hidden past, overly complicated story, and overly complicated plot points, all of which completely absent in the last film. Yeah, the gap between the mummy and Van Helsing is getting quickly smaller, isn't it? Evie opens the door using the combination she saw and they go inside. In the main chamber, Alex, because he doesn't mind being found, starts shooting at the thugs with a slingshot, freaking them out a bit. And they are easily freaked out. In the secret room, Evie recognises the Scorpion King's emblem. He's supposed to be pure myth. No, no trace of him has ever been found before. No, no artefacts, no archival evidence. Pure myth? Because someone who tried to conquer the known world, practically overran and destroyed Thebes, would have no place in recorded history? I find it hard to believe that not a single piece of physical evidence was dug up from the desert. Seems almost impossible. And the thug overhears Evie say something rather stupid. It's only a chest. No harm ever came from opening a chest. <laughs> right. No harm ever came from reading a book. You remember how that one went? Oh, come on. We can't stop now. I just remember I was the voice of reason here. Yeah, I think she's forgetting the last movie a bit too easily. 
You'd think she'd be at least a little bit reticent and smarter when dealing with this sort of thing. In the main chamber, Alex is still slingshotting rocks, giving away his presence by laughing, as the more suspicious thug sees where he is. In the chest room, Evie is trying to pry it open, but O'Connell finds the key, which was left with the chest because you don't want to make it too difficult to open. And inside, they find the bracelet of Anubis. Again, Alex fires a stone, but the thug catches it. Now they're gonna kill him. Unfortunately though, with Evie taking the bracelet, it activates a trap, because of course it does, and the ruins start shaking. Evie decides now's the time to read the inscription on the box, which says that if they disturb the bracelet, they'll drink from the Nile, meaning the ruins will now be flooded, which the thug narrowly avoids as the wall explodes with water. The first thug gets to the main chamber and tells the others to get the hell out of there, which stops Alex from being killed, but they still cause the scaffolding to fall before leaving. The O'Connells are running from the water, but they get to a dead end. Well, they're dead. You might be thinking they found a hiding spot or something to explain their survival. No. They're hit by several tons of water, slamming them against a the brick wall, and they're fine. All they have to worry about is slowly drowning. In the main chamber, the scaffolding Alex is on falls, taking out the pillars around the room, which of course they would imitate one of the dumber moments from the previous film. Also, due to the architecture, those pillars would be connected to the wall as well, so wouldn't have fallen anyway. And Alex tries to stop the last pillar from falling, because that'll help. But the pillar falls, smashing the wall, freeing Evie and O'Connell, so everything is okay again. Mom? Dad? I can explain everything. Yeah, except for that. What made them think that throwing a child into the series would make it better? What child watches a movie about mummies and heroic guys wielding guns and swords and says, I want to be the kid? Correction, I want to be that annoying kid. The film then shifts back to Hamanaptra. Well, what's left of it anyway, after its destruction and a huge excavation is taking place. And the books have been found as a rather familiar looking woman examines them. Yeah, that would be the reincarnation of Anaxon Amun, because reincarnation and destiny plays a big part in this film. But I'll hold my opinion on that for when it gets really stupid. The thugs from before show up because they're working for our diggers, and while digging at one of the sites, it starts rumbling, and then the ground starts growing and bulging. Uh, get out of the hole. Seriously, get out of the hole. Okay, don't say I didn't warn you. <laughs> These scarabs start doing what they do best, with Anaxon Amun. I'll call her that for simplicity's sake. Not really caring about the people dying, so we know this whole operation is evil. The guards quickly take care of the scarabs with flamethrowers, and then they find what they're looking for. We found him! <laughs> The corpse of Imhotep is found in a completely different place, so there was no need for those people to be in the scarab pit anyway. The thugs inform Anaxon Amun that they don't have the bracelet, and it's in London, so that's where they'll go to find it, but fortunately, the Medjai leader, Ardef Bey, is secretly watching. In London, the O'Connells get home, and they live in Wayne Manor, apparently. Seriously, that's Wollerton Hall, which was Wayne Manor in The Dark Knight Rises. It's been in other films too, of course, but Wayne Manor was the funniest. And inside, Evie tries to persuade O'Connell to go on a trip to find the oasis of Arm's share. But he knows how these things go. And if someone doesn't kill him, then he's gonna wipe out the world. How did you know? I didn't, but that's always a story. It's probably not a good move to point out how predictable your plot is. Outside, our bad guys from Hamanaptra have shown up, dressed exactly like they were in the desert. Because why bother to look inconspicuous? It's more dramatic that way. Also inside the house, O'Connell figures out that Evie's visions and her wanting to go to Armchair coincide with Egyptian New Year. And at the same time, Alex is drawn to the chest, opening it, and like the stupid git he is, puts on the bracelet, which activates some kind of vision of the pyramids and then Karnak as a form of directions. And now, of course, Alex can't get the bracelet off. I guess bringing about the apocalypse runs in the family. Meanwhile, Jonathan is in the house entertaining a lady friend, making up stories of his heroism, when the goons appear and they take Jonathan, who thinks they're there to collect some kind of debt. But they think he's O'Connell and has the bracelet, with Anox and Amun appearing with a snake to torture him with. But O'Connell bursts in, obviously confused by the reception. 
What kind of Mickey Mouse organization doesn't know the right person they're supposed to be interrogating and torturing? Was the plan really go here and torture the first guy they see? Not exactly the smartest bad guys. Alex has hidden the key so Evie won't find the bracelet missing and the lead goon walks in to ask for the chest, with Evie being full on badass, grabbing a sword and demanding he leaves, but more goons show up and then Ardef Bay gives Evie some backup. Back with O'Connell, they realise who he is and an axe on a moon chucks the snake at him, which O'Connell just catches and chucks it back. And then... <laughs> When the fuck did O'Connell become superhuman exactly? I know he's supposed to be the hero, but come on! That was ridiculous! Ardeth starts fighting the goons and Evie basically kicks ass, sword fighting like a champ. And O'Connell is dealing with a machine gunner ducking into the bathroom. And, as is the style with these kid-friendly movies, Ardeth Bay is slashing and stabbing guys and not a drop of blood is spilled. Which really irritates me, frankly. Ardeth and the lead goon have a showdown, but Evie's a woman, so she needs to be the damsel at some point, as another goon takes her, which distracts Ardeth long enough for him to be defeated by the lead goon, who runs off as well. O'Connell and Jonathan jump out the window, and they see the goons have taken Evie, and he asks Ardeth what the hell's going on, and he shows him a picture of the guy orchestrating things, which Alex recognises as the curator of the British Museum. Which is one thing that's never really explained, why the British Museum curator wants to help and worship Imhotep. He just does. There's never really any other motivation than that. You'd think he'd be a pretty diverse character, but no. He's just evil and wants to worship evil. That's it. Alex informs them that they don't actually have the bracelet, and then a funny moment. The son, you have started a chain reaction that could bring about the next apocalypse. You, lighten up. You, big trouble. You, get in the car. That was funny, but I have to note, the funny dialogue is a bit more few and far between this time round. They drive to the museum and Ardeth fills them in on the plot of the movie. They dug up Imhotep because he's powerful enough to kill the Scorpion King, and if he does that, he'll have command of his army. No real explanation on why exactly. The why question isn't really explored in this film. If you see anyone come running out screaming, it's just me. Another funny line from Jonathan there. You'll find, like I said, not many funny parts, but also that the majority come from Jonathan. Outside the car, gearing up with weapons, Ardeth notices O'Connell's tattoo. If I were to say to you, I'm a stranger traveling from the east seeking that which is lost. Then I would reply that I am a stranger traveling from the west. It is I whom you seek. And it is true. I... You have the sacred mark. More retcon added backstory bollocks. Also, why is O'Connell lost and why is Ardeth seeking him? If he's some kind of prophesied warrior of the Medjai, it's a pretty bloody good thing that Ardeth didn't kill him when he could have in the last film. Inside the museum, they started the ritual to raise Imhotep with Evie as a sacrifice. Why did they bring Imhotep with them? They're just going to take him back to Egypt anyway. It seems like a lot of pointless effort to get him there and then somehow get a walking corpse back to Egypt. But the ritual does what it's supposed to do. Well, not exactly. Who knew the resurrection ritual wasn't person specific? Clearly it's like crop dusting and you just resurrect everything in the vicinity. I wonder what the range on that is. And then, with O'Connell and Ardeth watching, Imhotep rises, regenerating slightly, probably because it was too expensive to animate his CGI gore. The curator tells Imhotep it's the year of the scorpion, which seems to please him. I think the filmmakers are confusing Egyptian culture with Chinese, because the Egyptian year of the scorpion is complete bollocks. The Egyptians don't have animal based years. So yeah, I think the filmmakers are a bit too eager to get to the third Chinese-based sequel. And they're the only ones eager to get to that film. An Axe on a Moon walks in with Evie recognising her, and Imhotep realises she's an Axe on a Moon, but only in body, and plans to bring her soul back as well, because he likes looking at gift horses in the mouth, I guess. And they find out the chest is empty, with the lead goon knowing where to look for the bracelet. As a gift for Imhotep, Anaxonamun offers to kill Evie for him, even though Imhotep thought she was the reincarnation of Anaxonamun in the last film. But who's thinking about continuity anyway? And despite having lots of guns, they choose to kill Evie in a sarcophagus filled with fire. Because there's no such thing as too elaborate, apparently. O'Connell jumps in, saving the day again, with Ardeth laying down some covering fire. And outside, Alex and Jonathan are panicking to get the car started, which ends with Jonathan breaking the key off in the ignition. Come on, come on! Come on! Uh, Be quiet, Alex! 
that there's gonna be any hysterics that come from me! Which, considering that ignition and key systems for cars weren't invented for another 16 years after this film is set, it's understandable he wouldn't know how to work one. Back inside, there's more shooting with O'Connell and Evie blasting their way out, and Imhotep, using a jar of some sort, summons mummies to chase after our heroes. And outside, Jonathan pulls up in a double-decker bus, of all things, as a getaway vehicle. We're back to the whole, this is London, core blimey governor, let's see all there is to see thing again, aren't we? You can take the director out of Van Helsing, but you can't take Van Helsing out of the director. The mummies burst through the wall and take chase after the bus, and after not too long, they manage to climb on board with them attacking O'Connell and Ardeth. And now they're on the bus, why is Jonathan still driving? Wouldn't it be simpler to stop the bus and deal with them instead of needlessly endangering lives and causing vast amounts of property damage? Speaking of which... Yeah, like that. They stop the bus with O'Connell and Evie having a kissy moment, which gives the bad guys time to nab Alex, even though there's no way they could have gotten there that fast, but oh well. The curator informs Imhotep that our heroes have the Scepter of Osiris, which is needed to kill the Scorpion King, but Imhotep is confident that he'll be powerful enough to kill him without it. What's that saying about hubris? And then he gives Anax and Amun a vision of ancient Egypt with them kissing, and she rather disgustingly fingers his face. Ardeth tells them that they need to get to Karnak, and O'Connell, much like in the previous film, has a friend with a flying machine who can help them get there quickly. Let's hope this one doesn't have a massive death wish. And I'm not a fan of them reusing the previous film's formula to this degree either. Imhotep and his goons are on a train in Cairo, and Alex thinks it's wise to smartmouth the crazy reincarnated lady. Lady, I behave for my parents. What makes you think I'm going to do it for you? Silence! because your parents wouldn't sleep poisonous snakes into your bed when you were sleeping. Why wait? I want to see that part. But no, Imhotep wants to speak to Alex first. The thugs from earlier also bring the cursed chest on board the train, and the suspicious guy identifies the curse, and they renegotiate their fee, which is reluctantly accepted. Alex is taken to see Imhotep and they have a little chat, with Alex being able to understand him because of the bracelet. And Imhotep tells him that the bracelet will kill him in seven days if he doesn't get to the pyramid at Arm's share, which Ardeth really should have mentioned at the time. Anax on Amun takes the chest and the thugs into Imhotep's room, and after they hear a creepy noise, she locks them in there, and Imhotep jumps out of the shadows to scare the crap out of them. Anax on Amun tells one of them that they need to open the chest to get rid of him, which he does, and Imhotep disappears, only to hang from the ceiling like Batman and proceed to suck the life out of the thugs with not very convincing CGI. The chest originally contained the canopic jars of Imhotep and the Black Book of the Dead, which were not in the chest. It's just weird to me that the chest would still be cursed and the curse would be protecting nothing. Now in Egypt, our heroes have found their ride called Izzy, who's happy to see O'Connell. Izzy! No! Hey! Or maybe not. But at least O'Connell handles it delicately. Never mind, force will do. And Izzy flat out refuses to help O'Connell on the grounds that he gets shot every time he does. Which is honestly a valid criticism. But O'Connell gives him money and to really convince Izzy to help, he gives him Jonathan's gold stick. And Ardeth shows up as well with a band of Medjai who aren't coming along because that would be far too helpful. And instead of a plane, this time they get on Izzy's hot air balloon. That night, Jonathan and Ardeth are talking, and Jonathan steals the gold stick back from Izzy. And Ardeth doesn't recognise the stick, which is odd because he recognises O'Connell's tattoo, which is linked to the stick. Back on the train, Alex's captors are regretting their decision to take him, as he's annoying the fuck out of them, with the old classic... No. 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 He really doesn't have much of a self-preservation instinct, does he? The goon then shuts him up with a well-placed knife which Alex, understandably, needs to use the bathroom after. And with Imhotep, he's now fully restored. And in the bathroom, Alex sees the toilet is just a hole to the tracks, and stops the train, allowing him to escape. However, he stopped the train at Karnak, exactly where they needed to go. And inside, Alex sees the next place they need to get to. Does that mean they would have driven right past if Alex hadn't have stopped the train? And Karnak is supposed to be part of the city of Luxor, which isn't just desert. People live there. 
Back on the balloon, Ardeth is trying to convince O'Connell to embrace his made-up for this film only destiny. And speaking of destiny, Evie has a vision caused by Imhotep giving Anoxon a moon her original soul, as she also has a vision of her previous life. The vision is of two women fighting each other while the pharaoh Seti the first watches, and you'll notice the women are fighting with size. Yes, they have a pair of one of these each. Remember when I said the filmmakers were jumping the gun a bit on the Chinese mythos? Yeah, this is a Chinese weapon. More specifically, a Chinese farming tool turned into a weapon, and has never ever been seen in Egypt anywhere. So why use it? Yes, the average viewer wouldn't notice, but that's not the point when you're making an action-adventure period piece. It's the principle of the thing. Also, Sighs aren't sharp. They're bludgeoning weapons. Why doesn't anyone get that right? The women fight, and after being knocked down, it's revealed one of them is Evie, and the other is Anoxana Moon. And it's clear that Anoxana Moon is the superior fighter here, as they continue to fight and change weapons, until Evie, or here Nefertiti, the pharaoh's daughter, is beaten, so she gets to protect the bracelet of Anubis. Because logic. And Anoxana Moon protects the pharaoh, and we all know how well that went. Evie then sees that event take place, as Nefertiri was watching as Anoxana Moon and Imhotep killed the pharaoh, which causes Evie on the balloon to fall, with O'Connell managing to grab her. And with Imhotep, Anoxana Moon recreates her death, which from what I can tell, kills the person she used to be and the original soul to inhabit her body, which is a really crap deal she made if you ask me. On the balloon, Evie, who's surprisingly calm about all this, explains the stuff about her memories and reincarnation, with Ardeth still trying to convince O'Connell. She's a reincarnated princess, and I'm a warrior for God. And your son leads the way to Hamshan. Three sides of the pyramid. This was all preordained thousands of years ago. A pyramid has four sides, Ardeth. Or are you saying they're a wonky pyramid that doesn't stand upright? Because that's just uncalled for, man. Also, to further prove the point that this movie's plot was made up as they went along, if Evie is the reincarnation of Nefertiri, then why hasn't Imhotep recognised her ever? you think he'd remember the daughter of the man he killed and is subsequently the reason why he's now a super-powered mummy man. Getting to Karnak, O'Connell and Ardeth find the train deserted, and in the ruins, Evie finds a clue, Alex's tie, and also where to look next. He made us a little sandcastle. It's the temple island of Philae. They've gone to Philae. Oh boy, Alex, come on! So then there's a montage of our group going to the different places Alex points them to and Ardeth informing the fucking massive army of Medjai where to follow them. But hang on. If there are that many Medjai, how weren't they able to stop the excavation of Imhotep at the start? They outnumber the bad guys like 10 to 1 at least. I guess they didn't think it was that important an issue. Our group, which is still following Imhotep, are pretty much right on his heels. However, Alex's next marker is discovered and destroyed but Imhotep has his signature move up his sleeve as he raises a giant wall of water. Last movie it was sand, this time water. Makes complete sense. The water reaches the balloon with his face on it, of course. Again, he likes that personal touch. And as the water is just about to swallow the balloon, Izzy activates rockets, causing it to speed off. Even though rockets on that thing would either cause it to spin around in place or rip the balloon off completely, but who cares about physics? They're just a distraction. And because of Imhotep's wall of water, it means our group get to arm share before Imhotep. But he does come back, hitting the balloon, causing it to crash into the jungle below. And then O'Connell, Ardeth, Jonathan and Evie leave Izzy in a pile of rubble with no resources and limited time to somehow repair the balloon. They don't ask much, do they? In the jungle, Imhotep's group are making their way to the pyramid, finding dead bodies all over. And up above, our group are waiting in an ambush, and even Jonathan is stepping up with a rifle. And back in the jungle, it's clear Imhotep's group is being stalked by something as creatures watch them from the bushes, and Imhotep tells the lead goon to kill Alex and get the bracelet. Frankly, he's had restraint to keep him alive this long. Then the thunder and lightning starts. Imhotep isn't worried as things can't harm him, but his goons start disappearing as the mummy pygmies, yes, you heard me right, the mummified pygmies, attack. As everyone panics with plenty of running and shooting, O'Connell and Ardeth run in for some added shooting, and with Evie and Jonathan giving covering fire, O'Connell grabs Alex and Ardeth gets his rematch with the goon leader. Ardeth wins his fight, obviously, and despite slashing the guy across the stomach and across the neck with an extended shocked face at defeat, still no blood. I know it's a kid's film, but does a lack of blood make it better? He still very clearly slashed up that guy. I just don't understand why it's the blood that's taken out, and not the killer act itself. 
O'Connell and Alex reunite with Evie and Jonathan, but Alex tells him that he has to get to the pyramid before sunrise. Oh my god. Well, that was rather understated. I like the way she said it too. Oh my god. Like she was saying, not this again. Which, frankly, I prefer that interpretation. Our group runs from the large group of pygmies chasing them, with Jonathan taking a wrong turn and bumping into a bad guy, which leads into possibly the funniest moment of the film. See those sacred stones? They'll never cross those! You are sure? Yes, of course I'm sure! <laughs> Sorry, my mistake! Yeah, that was pretty good. Everyone makes it across a tree bridge with Jonathan catching up and O'Connell busts out the trusty dynamite, which is a fireless explosive, so naturally there's a massive plume of fire and smoke. Evie notices the sun rising, so they need to hurry, with O'Connell grabbing Alex and running with the sun on his heels. Even though the sun would hit the pyramid before the ground, but let's not quibble over the details, the filmmakers aren't. O'Connell and Alex do make it inside the pyramid, with the bracelet falling off Alex's wrist. Evie and Jonathan turn up, however, there's a twist in the tale. <laughs> Yes, Evie is stabbed, and it's all so very sad with her dying. And if you can't see how this will be solved, you haven't been paying much attention. Imhotep and Anaxonamun enter the pyramid with Imhotep confident as fuck. Until this happens. It's surprising that he didn't know about that considering he knew everything else about this place. The curator, who's now wearing the bracelet, shoves his hand into a hole like a fucking moron, activating the temple, which summons the Anubis army, who is met by the Medjai. Luckily, they somehow knew exactly where the army was gonna rise, and Ardeth gets his ending boss fight. Outside, Alex gets the obvious idea to use the Black Book of the Dead to resurrect Evie, and inside, O'Connell sees the curator have the flesh stripped off his hand. See, I told you he was a moron. Jonathan fights with Anox and Amun for his climactic boss fight, so Alex can steal the book, and O'Connell finds Imhotep summoning the Scorpion King, so they both get an end boss fight. You notice the similarity here with another movie I reviewed? Yeah, this film's formula is very similar to the ending of Van Helsing. Even down to the shitty CGI, which we'll get to soon, is present in this film. Again, I'm sorry for bringing up Van Helsing, but these films are making it too easy. O'Connell faces off with Imhotep, jumping over the hell crevasse that's inexplicably there, and after losing his weapon, they begin to fist fight, which Imhotep is surprisingly good at for a priest. And the Medjai clash with the Anubis army in a massive battle spanning what looks like CGI as far as the eye can see. Then the film starts flitting back and forth between the fights in a rather annoying manner, so we see various successes between Ardeth, O'Connell and Jonathan. There's even a recreation of a scene in the first movie and a late attempt at some comedy where Alex can't figure out the last symbol of the inscription, which Jonathan recalls knowing because he did the same in the first film, allowing Alex to resurrect Evie. And she pops up to rescue Jonathan so she can have another badass moment for herself with a boss fight. And back with O'Connell and Imhotep, the Scorpion King arrives in all his fuck awful CGI, which is bad even for the time this movie came out and Imhotep tries to make the Scorpion King think he's there to help him and O'Connell wants to kill him, which he believes without question and starts attacking O'Connell. Evie and Anax and Amun start fighting again with those inaccurate as fuck size, however this time Evie beats Anax and Amun slashing her face, making her run off. I guess she died once and didn't like it. And the curator meets the Scorpion King and he gets rewarded for his devotion to Imhotep. In fairness, he was pretty useless. All he did was resurrect Imhotep, which could have been done by anyone with a knowledge of ancient Egyptians, so I'm not condoning Imhotep's actions, but I can see where he's coming from. Back at the battle, the day is seemingly won as Ardath kills the last of the Anubis creatures, and everybody celebrates at the relatively easy fight. That is, until Ardath looks over a nearby sand dune to see even more Anubis creatures approaching. Back with O'Connell, he finds a carving on the wall that has the same tattoo as he does, and also Jonathan's gold stick, which he discovers through lazy as fuck exposition, turns into a spear, and it's that is what's needed to kill the Scorpion King. Which is lucky that Jonathan brought it, and O'Connell takes a stupid amount of time to explain to Jonathan the stick turns into a spear, which I think is supposed to be funny, but it's just very annoying. The Scorpion King attacks again, cutting conversation short. 
and then with a heroic Ardeth readies his troops, which was a much better battle cry than the Scorpion Kings. Which means it's hot as hell. Yeah, no wonder he lost. Jonathan manages to get the spear out and throw it at the Scorpion King, but it's immediately caught by Imhotep, who has a bullet time throwing arm. But O'Connell catches it instead, and just before falling into the hell pit, stabs the Scorpion King with it. No! <laughs> we really don't need a translation for that over the top gesticulation. And the Scorpion King explodes into black smoke and his army dissolves right before getting to Ardeth's surprisingly low numbered army, considering how many there were at the start. O'Connell ends up hanging from the hell pit, and weirdly, so does Imhotep. I guess he jumped in there for dramatic effect. Evie runs to help O'Connell, grabbing him and pulling him up. And then Imhotep tries the same thing with an ox and a moon, but she tells him he's on his own and legs it. I do like that little smile he gives Evie and O'Connell. Maybe I'm reading way too much into it, but I like to think that smile is an acknowledgement of his mistake to devote his afterlife to a Nox and a Moon when he sees Evie and O'Connell together. At least, that's what I like to believe. So Imhotep dies to the Hell Pit, and a Nox and a Moon dies when she falls into a pit of scarab beetles, much like how Imhotep died originally. How about that for irony? But our group have to get out of the pyramid as the entire oasis is being sucked into it, pygmies and all. They reach the top of the pyramid with not much to save them really, but miracle beyond miracles, Izzy managed to get the balloon fixed and he picks them up. But not before Jonathan manages to nab the diamond at the top of the pyramid. And the film ends with O'Connell summing up the film for us. Bobbies, pygmies, big bugs. And then the obligatory kiss ending. Oh, please. Oh, please. The kid ruined that for me. So that was The Mummy Returns, and it's average. Painfully average. Everything about it is just not as good as the first film. Not as good acting, not as good comedy, not as good effects, and not as good story. Especially with these stupid added reincarnation and destiny bollocks that didn't need to be there. The simple fact is, O'Connell was the reluctant hero of the first film, and he was good like that. If you give him a fucking destiny, then you're just forcing his character along a path to save the world he doesn't actually want. A reluctant hero is always better than a forced into it hero. And yeah, the kid is fucking annoying, which I think I made clear. Why couldn't it have been Jonathan who wore the bracelet? At least then it would have been more fun. The Mummy Returns is average compared to the first one, but next week we got the Tomb of the Dragon Emperor, which is still inexplicably called the Mummy without having a single mummy in it. More on that next week. See you next time.